For most of history, a typical musician would learn to play one specific instrument. As synthesizers became available to the public, it became commonplace for a musician to create their own instruments using hardware and software. By the early 2000s, a digital audio workstation piece of software allowed a musician with a laptop to have access to the tools of a record producer. All of these tools changed how music is made. They increased the work of a musician by massive scales of complexity, and this ultimately gave rise to new genres and new ways of creating music. Creating electronic music on the computer today is a practice much like software engineering. Iteration, modularity, and software architecture skills are required to build a song intelligently. Music engineering also requires working at numerous levels of abstraction. The synthesizer level, the song arrangement level, the mixer level, and the design of melodies. Dom Kane is a musician and sound engineer who writes music for Mousetrap, a label started by Dead Mouse. He's built software synthesizers. He's worked with numerous artists as a producer. He's written music for film and TV. He joins the show to talk about working as a professional electronic musician. We also talk about the overlap between engineering and the different facets of creating modern music on the computer. It was great to talk to him, and I hope you enjoy the show. Accenture is hiring software engineers and architects skilled in modern cloud-native tech. If you're looking for a job, check out open opportunities at Accenture.com slash cloud-native-careers. That's Accenture.com slash cloud-native-careers. Working with over 90% of the Fortune 100 companies, Accenture is creating innovative, cutting-edge applications for the cloud. And they are the number one integrator for Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, and more. Accenture innovators come from diverse backgrounds and cultures, and they work together to solve clients' most challenging problems. Accenture is committed to developing talent, empowering you with leading-edge technology, and providing exceptional support to shape your future and work with a global collective that's shaping the future of technology. Accenture's Technology Academy, established with MIT, is just one example of how they will equip you with the latest tech skills. That's why they've been recognized on Fortune 100's Best Companies to Work For list for 10 consecutive years. Grow your career while continuously learning, creating, and applying new cloud solutions now. Apply for a job at Accenture today by going to Accenture.com slash cloud-native-careers. That's Accenture.com slash cloud-native-careers. Dom Kane, you are a music producer out of the UK. Welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We last spoke many years ago, I think three or four years ago, when you came on. It was a podcast I had called The Quora Cast, which I think many people listening to this show probably don't know about. But I had met you on Quora, and I had read a lot of your answers. You had a very scientific approach to music and music production, music technology, music engineering. And since then, I've, I've followed your work. I've read a lot of stuff and watched videos and listened to podcasts that you've done. And when I started this podcast, I wanted to do stuff about software engineering, but also the higher level engineering that happens to involve software. So I think of what you do as engineering with software, but you're not actually building software most of the time. And so I think our conversation will probably vacillate between the question of building software and the question of engineering music. But I guess we should just start by level setting for people who have little idea what a producer does. What does your work as a producer typically entail? Okay, so my career is kind of split three ways I tend to tell people. So I think music producer first and foremost. So I suppose most people would associate that to being a recording artist. However, rather than using my voice to you know to sing then i use synthesizers and to create my own voices 
with those, I suppose. So that's really first and foremost my main job. But uh, on top of that, I also, because of my experience and history with various synthesizer and, and synthesizer companies, I'm also a sound designer as well. So I, I develop a lot of the sounds that if somebody's going to go out and buy a synthesizer, then there's a good chance I made some of the original sound content that comes in those. And then on top of that, I tend to do a lot of audio engineering as well. And that's, I guess, perhaps where we overlap somewhat, because although I'm not, I would never call myself a dev or coder of, of any kind, I do deal with quite a lot of coders when they're developing the software packages for music producers or varying artists. And I do a lot of the testing for them. So I suppose it's it's more than the consumer side but not quite low-level stuff. But at the same time, I, I have a degree in hardware and analog engineering as well. So I guess that kind of all comes into play, really. So, yeah, fingers in pies. So do you say electrical engineering? It involved electrical engineering. So it was analog and digital audio system design, <laughs> which is a bit of a mouthful. So, yeah, so it involved, for example, we built hardware audio compressors and things like that and we also did digital equivalents as well so again it wasn't low level coding it was more using the object orientated software packages like max msp sometimes it would be sort of numerical stuff like matlab to sort of put in your algorithms to sort of try and work out what the software should do in theory and then obviously get to a point where you can print it to a PCB and then build the actual product. I always wondered what the different levels of abstraction were that went into making hardware synthesizer. I think I have a slightly better idea of how it works with a with a software synthesizer package, but maybe could you contrast the engineering process between those two things, like a hardware synthesizer versus a software-based synthesizer? I mean, I think when you get to low level stuff, there really isn't that much difference. You're essentially building, you know, resistor capacitor circuits. And in the digital realm, rather than building the circuit, you're, I suppose, you're instructing the the software package to reproduce what the equivalent resistor capacitor circuit would have done. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> but, I mean, hardware and software really, I guess there's a bit of a grey area with, with music products and, you know, consumer products in the music industry. You know, when we're talking things like synthesizers, for example, a lot of them nowadays, they don't tend to rely solely on analog resistor capacitor circuits. A lot of them are actually, I suppose my mind's drawn a blank now is it uh, fgpa or f yeah something fpg field programmable gate array that's the one essentially you know it's a small computer running software but actually with tangible buttons and dials and the vast majority of synthesizers now are essentially a software i suppose a one-off software package delivered as hardware I actually saw your name come up recently when I got a synthesizer pack, which was Serum, and it you had programmed some of the synths in it. I think that was I think that was what it reminded me. I was like, I haven't talked to Dom in a while. I should reach out to Dom because I, I you know I downloaded this synthesizer. I actually paid for this one, <laughs> and uh, you know I, I was flicking through the presets and and I saw your name and I was like, oh, Dom made this and it's a great bass instrument and I'm going to use it in this song. What's the process of programming a synthesizer in one of these, or I guess programming a preset in one of these synthesizers? So with Serum, it was designed and created by Steve Duda, who is just an absolute mathematical genius. And it started, wow, it must have been 2012, something like that. And he sent me what was really just a sandbox sketch of what could have been a synthesizer at the time. I mean, it was really fundamental basics and he was asking me, well, my thoughts on it really. So I, I sort of wrote down some thoughts and he sort of thrashed out where he was wanting it to go and he'd sort of explained that he wanted wavetable synthesis. So 
without trying to get too deep into synthesis types, but there are, for example, your most common synthesizer uses what's called subtractive synthesis. So it starts with a noise engine, essentially creating white noise. And then by turning the dials and pressing the buttons, you're essentially removing the unwanted bits of noise to create a sound that you actually want. Whereas Serum was fundamentally based on wavetable synthesis, which is where you have a looping waveform that can be any size and shape, and it fixes to a grid system so you can adjust the loop start and end points to create entirely new sounds and then layer them in. So a lot of it started with us recording various sounds. It could have been, you know, a drum strike or it could have been an old vintage analog synthesizer and then analyzing the waveforms from there and finding certain parts that would fit a 1024 sample grid. And it was really sort of trial and error at the beginning. And then you'd have a dial where you can sweep which part of that waveform. So the waveform could be, let's say, half a second in length, but you're actually only looping, you know, five to 10 milliseconds of it to create an entirely new waveform. And then it would be sweepable within the larger waveform so that you could manipulate the sound in the synthesizer. So yeah, so that's kind of how wavetable synthesis begins. It was a mammoth project on Steve's behalf. And yeah, the finished product is just incredible. So from my perspective, that's really where it started. It was quite a low level involvement, I suppose. And then as you know, he started developing more graphical features to it, then it got to a point where he'd decided, right, this is a stable version of what will eventually be the final product. So then it's a case of me going through those wavetables and sounds and and really just tinkering with it. And for me personally, what I tend to do is I tend to really just work normally and start writing music and coming up with melodies and ideas and bits and pieces using that synth and then every now and then I'll sort of keep tweaking it and tweaking it and then I'll go hang on this is a great sound and I'll save that that preset state and then move on to another one and and just keep moving on until eventually you end up with a, a bank of sounds that you know are usable because they they work in your own productions. That's a great way of coming up with synths. If you start with the raw synthesizer and you start working on a song and you have some vision, you develop some vision for the sound over time and how it fits in with the context of your song. And if it's a good synth in the context of your song, it's probably going to be a good synth in the context of other people's songs. Yeah, that's certainly what I hope will happen. You know, sometimes you'll develop a sound that really could just be a background sound to a track. You know, obviously when you buy a new synthesizer, it's jam-packed full of huge sounds that, you know, sometimes you can just press one note on a keyboard and you think, oh my God, this is this is an entire track in its own right. But I think those oddly tend to be the least usable sounds from my perspective as a consumer because I don't want the synth to do everything for me. So for me personally, what I'll tend to do is start with a bit of a blank canvas and just start writing my own music and start developing, you know, little melodies and counter melodies. And then maybe in the counter melody, I'll start tweaking something so that it's really becomes more of a faint background sound. And it's at that point where I start to go, hang on, this is now you. Usable, and that's where it becomes more of a preset for me. So as you said, Serum is a wavetable synthesizer, and you, the primitive sound that is getting manipulated is it's a wave file? Or yes. Like a, an actual wave file, so like a wave file that you play on your And computer. actually, Steve took that to a whole new level eventually. In the latest version, well, I think probably from version one onwards, he also made it so that if if you really delve deep into Serum, you can actually draw your own waves. So it's also got a, a essentially a wavetable creator in there. So if, for example, you wanted you know a saw wave, which we all know to look like a, a saw's tooth, you know, you could use that and then you can f- switch on the pen tool and then just draw a couple of additional spikes along the harmonics of that wave and create an entirely new sound from that. And it's all very, very usable. How does the usability of 
that wavetable contrast with the other way of, of building a synthesizer where it starts with white noise? I mean, they're just two entirely different beasts, I suppose, from both a consumer perspective and a, a designer perspective. But at the same time, they produce the output isn't necessarily completely distinguishable. But I think subtractive synthesis is probably a more logical approach because you start with noise and you're just removing elements of it. So, for example, you know, you'll have an envelope generator with ADSR, which is your attack, decay, sustain and release. And by using that, you can just shape the output waveform, basically. But with Wavetable, it just... I guess it's far more open canvas and allows you to quickly shape far more unique sounds. I think in an ideal world, the end user probably shouldn't need to care about which one is which and what they're doing because hopefully the, the user interface is, is good enough that it just becomes quite a, a, a fluid process anyway. Speaking of user interface... My understanding is that Serum was designed to be a more simplified version of Massive, which is another synth with more parameters. Maybe not. Maybe it's not that simplistic. Like it wasn't. That wasn't the direct design decision. But like I, I have Massive and the other synths that come with Complete Nine, which is a Native Instruments package. So it, uh, <laughs> I got it on Amazon. It's like a bunch of CDs. So every time I have to reinstall it, I have to use a uh, an external uh, CD drive because my 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 MacBook no longer <laughs> accepts CDs. But Massive is this amazing synthesizer, and I had been working on music for a pretty long time before I, you know, and I was just using whatever presets FL Studio gives you, which are great. And you know, there's some great primitives, and you can learn a lot just working with primitives like just super basic ones that that FL Studio gives you, and figuring out how to how to make use of those. But you get to a certain point and you say, you know, what what is out there? What's at the higher end of the budget spectrum? And then you, you get one of these maybe kind of pricey, but relative to how much value you can get out of it, not very pricey, synth packages like Native Instruments. And you, you check out Massive and you just realize, oh my gosh, I have been making my life way more difficult than it needs to be. Massive is fantastic. It's got a lot of knobs to tune, and it's a little bit different in terms of user interface than Serum, and I still use both of them, but can you describe the trade-offs in those, in like user interface design, or, or, because I think they're both, are they both wavetable synthesizers? Yeah, they're both very similar. I think picking apart the differences interestingly you said that serum was more simplified actually it's it's far more complicated than massive but but i'm glad you said it was simplified because i think that was really the ultimate goal of serum was being able to provide far more complex sounds and complex algorithms but keeping the user interface to a usable position and i think that's that's where steve really sort of nailed serum was you could be a complete novice user of any synthesizer and you could install serum and within a few minutes you're getting some great sounds out of it and you can work it out it's it's not too difficult however the the, the deeper you delve in when you start sort of uh, assigning modulators to further modulators to even more modulators like LFOs and various things like that. And then you can assign those modulators to effects units and things hidden away in the back. You know, it can get hugely complicated after a while. And I think that was kind of the key to Serum was that you could, I hate to say it, but a one-stop shop of synthesizers because there are a lot of original analog recordings that have gone into the wavetables there's obviously you know huge amounts of digital synthesis going on and at the same time there are huge effects units there's distortion there's reverb there's echoes there's chains and chains of effects you can place on these sounds you know it kind of has everything but again going back to that user interface it, i think it does come across as perhaps more simplified than massive but actually I, I would say it's far more complex in that you know like i say you can draw your own waveforms and really start experimenting with it but but at the same time you don't need to and that's not pushed into you which is what makes it appear so simple
DigitalOcean is a reliable, easy to use cloud provider. I've used DigitalOcean for years, whenever I want to get an application off the ground quickly. And I've always loved the focus on user experience, the great documentation, and the simple user interface. More and more people are finding out about DigitalOcean and realizing that DigitalOcean is perfect for their application workloads. This year, DigitalOcean is making that even easier with new node types. A $15 flexible droplet that can mix and match different configurations of CPU and RAM to get the perfect amount of resources for your application. There are also CPU-optimized droplets, perfect for highly active front-end servers or CI-CD workloads. And running on the cloud can get expensive, which is why DigitalOcean makes it easy to choose the right size instance. And the prices on standard instances have gone down too. You can check out all their new deals by going to do.co slash sedaily. And as a bonus to our listeners, you will get $100 in credit to use over 60 days. That's a lot of money to experiment with. You can make $100 go pretty far on DigitalOcean. You can use the credit for hosting or infrastructure, and that includes load balancers, object storage. DigitalOcean Spaces is a great new product that provides object storage. And, of course, computation. Get your free $100 credit at do.co slash sedaily. And thanks to DigitalOcean for being a sponsor. The co-founder of DigitalOcean, Moisey Uretsky, was one of the first people I interviewed, and his interview was really inspirational for me, so I've always thought of DigitalOcean as a pretty inspirational company. So thank you, DigitalOcean. I think what gives the simplicity for me is the FX panel. I honestly, I haven't tweaked synthesizers enough to be uh, really well versed in what is a, a simple user interface versus a complex user interface. I am the kind of person that is a broad swath of the target market for these kinds of synthesizers because I'm I like I'm not a professional musician. I'm somebody who does it in their spare time. And so like, how can I be productive in a shorter span of time? And productive to me means finishing songs. And that so that means like being effective in the synthesizer. And the FX panel in Serum it has like larger panels and, and whereas in massive i feel like i have to like click on this little drop down menu and like scroll to this little thing and i can't really visualize what this new thing is going to give me whereas in serum you've got this fx panel with distortion and reverb and delay and it's almost like i've got a mixer right in serum itself on one of the panels do you think that if you're putting yourself in the shoes of a of a synthesizer designer do you want to make it so that the sound designer, the musician, doesn't ever have to assign this synthesizer to a mixer panel? Or like theoretically, you could do all the mixing that you needed to do at the synth level and never have to go to the mixer? Yes and no. I think we have reached a stage where a lot of synth developers are now starting to almost over-engineer the software. Interestingly, you mentioned native instruments. I used their machine version one when that came out. And, you know, I've got to be honest, I, I hated it for a long time and, and still do to an extent because what they tried doing was essentially it's, it's a piece of hardware connected via USB. The 16 trigger pads on there appears as though it should be fairly simple. There's some infinite ro rotary dials on there. I think there's eight or nine of those, and that's essentially it. And it came with a software package that you could run inside another software package or as a standalone, and it allowed you to, you know, drag and drop, you know, samples from, you know, kick drums, snares, whatever drum sounds, percussion sounds, or even apply notation on piano rolls and things like that. But unfortunately they'd built the software as an entire workstation within its own right so those rotary dials became useful for dragging and dropping different effects and things like that but then those effects you had to assign to either individual pads or groups or channels or stems and there were so many options that it just felt like every time you wanted to tweak a sound 
slightly you felt like you had to apply for a government grant to to do that you know it was it just took an eternity and you were in and out of menu systems and for me you know i i bought the machine thinking well this would be great for live shows because i can just you know bash out these buttons and twist these dials and away i go and that just wasn't the case so while that package you can quite literally build you know you could build an entire track you've got the the whole workflow you can work in in various different time formats whether it be individual strikes of percussion or individual notes or loops or series of loops and then you can control which series of loops in what order and then randomize it so you could create an entire track from start to finish that could be you know half an hour long but that lost its simplicity then and and i felt like the whoever had designed that had an idea in their mind and then it was almost you know too many cooks got involved and you know it just ended up being this mammoth package and i think a lot of synth designers at the moment i don't know if it's because they're trying to compete with the likes of massive or serum or, or packages like that you know where they do have stacks of effects and things but I think we're getting to a point now where where a lot of people are starting to sort of really over-engineer a lot of their synths and sometimes you you just want to be able to buy a toy that makes a noise and you know and just play with it and for me even as a sound designer I actually want more simplicity in my synthesizers which is why I quite often refer back to analog synths and use hardware synths in my own work because I like the freedom of restrictions and I know that sounds like it's uh, a bit of a contradiction in terms but for example one of my hardware Moog synths I refuse to save a preset on it and and actually that's over the last few years has kind of become my signature sound that I use on that synth but for me I refuse to save it as a preset I refuse to recall that sound ever again even though I I have it in almost every track I do I prefer to rebuild it every time because every time it's just slightly different and for me I find it really liberating to be able to make a noise and go this is the one I'm going to hit record go for it play with all the dials in real time record all the automations in by hand and then that's it i'm happy with that recording that's the one delete and then it's gone forever yeah well it can be nice to i do something similar i always start from a clean slate when i'm making it at the song level at least and even though i could you know i do something similar in many different cases i don't find myself saving templates and maybe i'm just being irrational and I'm not saving myself time and I should be saving myself time and saving a template of a song. But I do kind of enjoy the process of it. Like, you know, it's like setting the table or doing the boilerplate work builds a little bit momentum. And you're right. It does. It does vary each time a little bit. So I've wanted to do some shows around the engineering of digital audio workstations. I haven't, I haven't been able to get anybody from uh, FL studio or Ableton or garage band but i am curious about that because what i like about digital audio workstations is it seems like these are super durable pieces of software some of these workstations have been around for decades well not maybe not decades but decade and a half or a decade and i imagine the like managing a piece of code that is that old can get really hard and yet they still they still seem to advance, even if it's just on the user interface level, or it's maybe it's a testament to their core code base that they seem to, to stand the test of time. I know this is not your expertise, but have you met with any people who work at these companies? Do you have a perspective for how engineering works at ImageLine or the Ableton company? Well, interestingly, one of my good friends who's also called Dom is the owner of Bitwig. So he's the guy behind Bitwig Studio, which is the latest and greatest workstation. And I don't mind saying I I use that in all my productions. It's I've been fully into Bitwig since version one. So, yes, I have spoken to him a lot about it. And it's interesting to hear you say that because actually I was 100% Ableton for production work. And it got to, I think, version nine, where I started noticing that, you know, there were serious issues with basic things like MIDI routing 
and I remember talking to some of the staff there and they'd sort of acknowledged it off the record in saying yeah we know there's some issues there and it's in our base code and in order to change x y and z we'd need to really you know start from scratch again and that's not going to happen and similar things were happening in Pro Tools, which at the time I was using Pro Tools for all my mixing and mastering. So it's it, it's interesting to hear you say that they've they've sort of stayed on top of it all. Whereas for me personally, I felt like people weren't staying on top of it, which was one of the reasons why I, I got involved with beta testing for Bitwig. And it's very similar to Ableton and, and in fact was started by ex-Ableton staff. I know there are rumours all over the internet that they hated Ableton or something like that. It's just not true. They were really just excitable developers who said, hey, let's start our own and see what we can do, you know. And that's exactly what they did and, and is now flourishing. So, you know, Ableton had some fairly severe issues when it came to... There were... PDC issues, which is plugin delay compensation. So if you had a series of plugins on one channel that were fairly CPU intensive because of the architecture of the software, if you were then to automate the gain up and down across time, there would be delays. And, and, and sometimes you could end up with delays of, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 milliseconds which meant if you were automating something like a hi-hat, there was just no chance of it being in time and it just became a nightmare. And to my knowledge, those issues really couldn't be fixed without scrapping the whole Ableton project and, and starting all over again for the developers, uh, which, you know, I can completely understand that's not what they wanted to do. You know, Bitwig was, I don't think it came out of the back of that issue, but they certainly went into it knowing what the modern day producer expects from a workstation. From my perspective, it's leaps and bounds ahead of all the others because you can build your own modulators and, and assign pretty much any parameter to any other parameter. And they've got some just phenomenal, you know, groundbreaking tools built in. They're also making it parts of it open source as well. So you can actually start to develop your own plugins inside Bitwig. So I think the fundamental platform for any workstation, you know, when you're dealing with, I guess, two different sorts of timelines in, in software. So you're dealing with, you know, the real time processing and, and clip arrangement and development compared to the overall arrangement and timeline, providing you've got all those in place, then I think, you know, 10 to 15 years shelf life is, you know, in the world of software. I'm sure that's that's a really long time. So, yeah, so I think these companies do incredibly well to be able to get it to last as long as it does. Well, the other interesting thing about these digital audio workstations is most of them are not really web-based. They're just these big monolithic pieces of software that run on your on your computer, which is the exception by far in software these days. Most of my work, like I've got 50 web browsers open right now, and then I've got like GarageBand open just recording this audio and that's about it, you know, a couple other des small desktop applications, but most things are moving to the web, and it'll be interesting to see, there are some developments in browser technology, we've done some shows recently that, I don't know if you knew this, but Reason, they managed to port their digital audio workstation to the browser recently because of this new WebAssembly technology, so we might see more of these coming to the browser, whether that matters, I, I don't know, we'll see, but it is funny that there have been certainly advancements in music production technology, but a lot of it has not really involved the web. I mean, it, the splice might be the exception. Isn't that fun? Don't you find that curious that the internet hasn't really impacted the digital audio workstation world as much, or has it? I guess yes and no. So, for example, I mean, pre-internet days, there was a company called Loopmasters who are still going now and I still do regular work for them. As a music producer, if you wanted a new bank of 
drum sounds or, or loops or something to play with, then you would go on to the Loop Masters. I think it was a magazine at the start or a catalogue, I should say, and, and then eventually a website where you could order a CD and, you know, you'd so th- there could be oh, some real drummer recordings or it could be, you know, uh, some electronic drum machine sounds or whatever. And you'd be able to order a CD and it would arrive by post and, and hey, presto, you've got a new bank of sounds. Then obviously with the birth of the internet and and server space becoming a more realistic thing, they it's all downloadable now. Whereas now they've launched Loop Cloud and um, with Loop Cloud you run it as a plugin in your workstation, but it's essentially an online browser for their entire catalogue. So you can then, I, I don't know if they do a subscription or something like that, I think, where basically you, you know, it's, it's running as a little browser. And rather than browsing your hard drive when you're searching for a, a specific sound, it'll browse their online catalogue and make it available for that project file. So I think, you know, there are companies doing a lot. In fact, I'm working on a project myself at the moment with a couple of friends. We're sort of testing the processing capabilities of a server at the moment to try and offer online near instant mastering. And so we've sort of had to delve into that. And, and I think I th- I feel like that's perhaps where the industry is heading as well, because with the Internet and the availability of all these tools now, I guess the, the advancement of technology produces, you know, traditionally needed an entire studio full of analog equipment and an engineer to run it all. Whereas now it's all done on, I guess, a budget laptop will do these days. And that means there are a lot of producers writing their own material in hotel rooms around the world before they go to a gig. They're looking to get that track mastered so it's at least safe to play in in their gig later that evening. So funnily enough, I think this all came from a Cora question. Somebody asked, is it possible to have an algorithm based piece of mastering software? And I think that was probably one of the last questions I ever answered on Cora before I then sat there afterwards going, well, theoretically, it's possible. I suppose there is a specific science to mastering music, and I suppose it needs to achieve a certain amount of things and it needs to run through certain checks. And and then I started thinking, I wonder if that is possible and can I do it? So I then got in touch with a couple of mates who computer science specialists. And um, yeah, and we've spent the last couple of years testing out bits and pieces now and we're we're hopefully going to get to a stage later this year where we can actually open it up for beta testing oh wow i will be the first to sign up for that (laughs) That because there's well there's a tool that offers this for podcasting that's really popular and i can uh, i can look it up later on and and give that to you maybe that would be useful but i found it to be a little too I'm sure you you're encountering this where it's just like there's so many edge cases and it's like what you know what what is the general piece of wisdom that you can try to get your software to convey in I mean well the thing is you've written about this so much like I I remember reading your blog a couple of years ago when I was working on an album and I was at the phase where I was trying to mix and master it and I was reading your tips and tricks about okay here's the kind of eq you want to put on a snare channel here's a kind of eq you want to put on hi-hats like don't do this with vocals and it was really useful but there's a lot of edge cases and and so so with this piece of software are you going to have to put in all the different channels or is it just going to be you give it the one overall wave file and it tweaks it as necessary yeah it would be the one overall wave file so the idea is is that a mastering engineer will always say that they can only ever be as good as the mix engineer so you know clearly if you provide a mastering engineer with a terrible mix then you're going to get a terrible master it's as simple as that and i think the whole point of this project is going to be so we're trying to make it learn and i think that's probably one of the hardest parts but eventually it will hopefully get to a stage where the more users use it the more it's going to recognize what the desired outcome is so clearly without giving away industry secrets there's there's lots of 
statistical an analysis within the numbers that will essentially go right in this genre of music they tend to prefer this frequency range to appear at this volume relative to this frequency you know so it, it needs to spit out a lot of numbers and then check the numbers and then adjust accordingly but yeah it's kind of a passion project at the moment I'm, I'm not expecting it to replace real people or anything like that but but I do feel like at some point in the future people probably will be replaced by far better systems than this one so I think going back to your previous question about the, the internet and things being web-based, I think we probably are getting there very slowly. But again, with, with workstations, you know, the processing power needed for a good workstation to do its job properly, there's such a combination between things being RAM intensive and CPU intensive that, that really at the moment, you know, server side, you know, they'd have to be beasts of machines working on it to to get a workstation to to do what we really want i think for the basics to happen could be fairly straightforward for for any workstation developer but then would it be in their interests to provide a system that's really quite restricted and limited when a quick download and you've got your own processing power and i think technology is probably advancing you know the technology of of laptop power is advancing far quicker than the technology of, of server-side power. Going back to the mastering tool, it seems like you could also do this at the mix level. So if so, let's say you know, I can standardize most of what my channels are. So I've got a base, maybe you know, I've got two different kinds of bases. I've got a kind of a, a wet, you know, mogi base, and then I've got like a dry saw base. I've got a kick channel, I've got a snare channel, I've got a, a hi-hat channel. It seems like you could also, you could put those individual, you could have a different piece of software that puts those individual things into some kind of set of algorithms and it takes care of that for you. Have you thought about that problem at all? It's come up and then quickly been shut down <laughs> um, at, at this point in particular. So the, the, the main guy I'm, I'm working on this with, one of my friends since birth, and we used to run a company together that was for musicians or, or record labels, I should say, to deliver promo copies of their forthcoming releases to their mailing list so that they could get feedback from DJs or magazines or whatever and it's probably commonplace now but back then and this is 2008 I think it was there wasn't really such a system and what happened was I, I was writing music sending it out to DJs and I remember one time I had written a remix of a track and I'd sent it out to probably 50 DJs that I, I had a, a list of their email addresses that I regularly sent work out to. And, and, you know, of the 50 you send it to, maybe two or three of them would get back to you going, love this or hate this or whatever, you know, giving some sort of constructive feedback. Clearly, when it's if it's a big name DJ that's playing your music, you want to use that in your promotional material. So when it goes to stores, you can say as supported by dot, dot, dot and done a remix and i'd sent it out to probably 50 maybe 100 max djs and didn't hear anything back or nothing out of the ordinary and it was probably six months after the release i found out david getter had been playing it on his radio show and i just thought that's huge but i didn't know and i've only just found out uh, so it was incredibly frustrating then because i thought well hang on if i'd have gone to the online stores and said this is being supported by David Guetta you know global megastar I'm sure they'd have made it a, a song and dance about it and they'd have given it some front page features and you know it, it would have been a big deal but actually the sales were not much different to any other release I'd had at the at the time so we ended up building this system it, we really just sort of built it for myself just as a again a passion project what we've done is we've basically built it so that I could upload my mailing list, you know, much like MailChimp or something like that, but then also attach the MP3s and then it would spit out a preview file and you wouldn't be able to download those until you filled in the feedback box. 
and, and so that was basically the the premise was you know so if they didn't want it then close browser end of move on and if they did want it then they'd they'd have to give me some feedback so yeah so we started doing that and then we decided hang on this is this is potentially something so we opened it out to the public and and set up a i think it was a subscription service and that did fairly well although you know neither of us really knew what we were doing in the dev side of things it was all php and uh, and an absolute nightmare to maintain so we ended up giving up on all of that just purely because it was it was just too much of a headache to run and i've forgotten your original question well, I was asking about if you could do this at the individual instrument level, if you could oh, say... Oh, that was it. Sorry. Yeah. So off the back of that, we'd sort of learned so many lessons. And I, I hope half your listeners don't get offended. And I hope half your listeners probably at least agree. But the end user of websites can often be just dumbfounding. And some of the issues we had in running that where... You know, it was there were just so many facepalm moments where somebody would have a problem that that really just wasn't a problem, and they'd make a huge song and dance about it. And you know, uh, simple things like the artwork needed to be a square image because it needed to fit the format of the page. Fairly simple, and it needed to be either JPEG or PNG or whatever. You know, we'd we'd restricted it to say four or five file types. Now you'd think that that would be a fairly straightforward ask of a, of an end user but you know it just wasn't the case there were people coming back saying oh it won't upload my image and we'd go yeah that's because it's not square or you know that's because you're trying to upload an mp3 and that's not an image you know so we did briefly discuss the idea of having it trying to automate mixes but I think musically and scientifically, I think it's probably far too complicated to get into that at this stage. But first and foremost, I think, you know, if if you had a channel called kick drums and, you know, kick drums are essentially the, the front line and focus of any electronic music track, we know full well that people will be uploading vocals in the kick channel and kicks in the vocal channel and it's just you know it's asking for a nightmaring customer support and yeah so we, we like I say so that that did come up that's a hugely long-winded answer i apologize but it did come up but it quickly got shut down for those reasons but having said that you know the caveat i guess is it wouldn't surprise me in the next five to ten years if that does become something that we'll see whether that comes from me or not is anyone's guess Citus Data can scale your Postgres database horizontally. For many of you, your Postgres database is the heart of your application. You chose Postgres because you trust it. After all, Postgres is battle-tested, trustworthy database software. But are you spending more and more time dealing with scalability issues? Citus distributes your data and your queries across multiple nodes. Are your queries getting slow? Citus can parallelize your SQL queries across multiple nodes, dramatically speeding them up and giving you much lower latency. Are you worried about hitting the limits of single node Postgres and not being able to grow your app? Or having to spend your time on database infrastructure instead of creating new features for your application? Available as open source, as a database as a service, and as enterprise software, Citus makes it simple to shard Postgres. Go to citusdata.com slash sedaily to learn more about how Citus transforms Postgres into a distributed database. That's C-I-T-U-S-D-A-T-A dot com slash sedaily, citusdata.com slash sedaily. Get back the time that you're spending on database operations. Companies like Algolia, Prosperworks, and Cisco are all using Citus, so they no longer have to worry about scaling their database. Try it yourself at citusdata.com slash sedaily. That's citusdata.com slash sedaily. Thank you to Citus Data for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. I think the average musician is just becoming more 
technically competent. And I think over time, I, I mean, the, th- the thing that that gets me working on music is I I constantly feel like I am I am my productivity is being underutilized, and I feel like it's partially partially my fault because I get distracted and I, you know, focus too much on one side of things. And then I realize three hours have passed and I've been working on tweaking, you know, this EQ channel on a synth that I'm not even using anymore. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a problem that's going to be hard for software to fix. But there are other problems that like software should probably be fixing for me. Like I, I, f- I do feel like when I read your instructions, which are like, you should make your EQ like this. I'm like, why isn't why isn't this taken care of for me? <laughs> you know, why isn't you know why hasn't this been turned into a piece of software? I mean, I, maybe to some extent it has. Maybe there are better EQs that I'm not using that have better presets, and I'm just not like using those intelligently. So I interviewed the CTO of that recently, and it was really thought provoking for me. What's his name? Sorry, his name is Matt Amon. Oh, okay, okay, it's not the one yeah. I know. Yeah. And so what, what's interesting about Splice is I think they quickly, when they started building stuff for Splice, they were like, okay, we are going to do version control for for songs and we're going to do backups and make it easy to, to go back to a previous version as a song, which that's a really useful thing. And then they realized, okay, you can also share this with other people and then you can make it easier to do remixes and fork a song and go off and do your own version of it. And then you've got all the stems and and they reverse engineered the file formats of Ableton and FL Studio and uh, the digital audio workstations, which was not easy. And that in itself was really interesting. But then they found that where the actual money was, was in this same kind of thing, that the loop, what you've said with the Loop Masters, where people want a subscription to getting these sounds and working on these sounds. And perhaps, uh, and Steve Duda's the, the Serum side of things, that they, did, they built a rent-to-own synthesizer model, which is pretty sweet. Like, you don't have to pay 100 bucks up front. You pay $10 for 10 months, and then you get the synth. That's pretty great for a lot of people. But the thing is, they I think what they found is there's so many opportunities that they, they're focused on a certain subset of them right now. And the thing that I always am thinking about is, why isn't electronic music collaboration easier? And I wonder if it's if it's a facet of the technology or if there is just not a world in which so like in software you have hundreds or thousands of developers that will sometimes collaborate on a piece of software but you don't see this in the music world where there's there's not a there i can't think of a song a recent song where there are hundreds or thousands of people who have collaborated on the song across the internet and it seems strange to me i think it's probably down to the human side as musicians we're so self-involved and have such big egos that we want to be in the spotlight and i think it's probably not so much the technology but more the egos involved and i think if i'm completely honest that's probably what it comes down to i guess you know splice interestingly i I tested the beta version of that uh, from very early days back in must have been 2013 or maybe 14 and it was sort of sold to me as a, a collaboration thing and 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 i tested it and it worked and it was fine and then i kind of felt like okay i'm not sure when I would use this because I mean first and foremost though most of the producers that I was doing any collaborations with weren't using Ableton or didn't have Splice and I suppose you know that's probably a different story now so there was there were certainly those as fundamental issues but I think when you're dealing with uh, sometimes I forget that music is actually a creative thing and I suppose when you're developers i mean clearly you're being creative with code so there's i I don't want to take away anything from that but you're you have very clear set definitions and goals that can be perhaps achieved by different approaches but you're quite restricted in in which avenue you can take to achieve that outcome whereas in the world of music there are no bounds to how anything is achieved and there's no because it's you know the output is entirely subjective to anyone i guess it's probably quite difficult to put those restrictions in place because most musicians don't want any restrictions and they certainly don't want guidelines or 
tracks to to run in one particular direction so i think it's probably more a question of of humans being collaborative rather than the technology not providing the platform for those humans to become collaborative if that makes sense yeah well those same questions go through my head because there are a few examples that i, I hear about occasionally where there's just an example of, of, of music collaboration over the internet that works out really well. And the, the main one that comes to mind is kind of primitive at this point, but Postal Service, you know, that kind of pop band Postal Service from a while ago? They were big, in, in at least in the States, for a while. And they were called Postal Service because this was actually way back. They, they wrote the song over email. Uh, this was the lead singer of Death Cab for Cutie and some um, electronic musician he worked with and a couple vocalists. And they would just trade emails back and forth and and pass the song back and forth over email and say hey i got this now why don't you write your thing and then you know somebody else passed it back and said okay now you write your thing and i was like that seems productive you know and they they managed to be productive i don't know what magical chemistry made it work but and you know you hear this sometimes with with very you know like somebody who a well a well established a couple DJs or a couple DJs and a vocalist can work together remotely, maybe because they all have high expectations for themselves and for each other, and they know that each person is going to fulfill the responsibilities. And I've also, I've worked with people sometimes where, you know, like I, when I worked, I actually worked with you on my last album when, when I was like, hey, I need some help mixing. Can you, can you help me with the mixing? And you said, sure. Can you give me very clear instructions for what you need from me? And I gave you, you know, I think some reasonably clear instructions or maybe some vague instructions. And then I had, you know, if I, if I gave vague instructions, then I didn't have super clear expectations. I just said, Hey, I trust you, you know, you run with it and do that. I don't know. It's, it's, to me, these seem like solvable problems. They seem like problems worth solving because I look at, at software engineering and I look at music and I see two worlds where in both worlds, you want an end product that is good. You know, there is there is some goodness that you can, maybe it's subjective, but you can still agree, come to an agreement that a song is good or a piece of software is good. I don't know how to get how to get there, but I'm kind of inspired by that vision. Yeah, I, I guess maybe this is where the humans haven't caught up with the technology rather than the technology haven't caught up with the humans. But I find, you know, for me, Dropbox has been an absolute savior you know being able to to so for example you know i mentioned earlier on i use bitwig as my workstation and all of my bitwig project files are contained within dropbox so every time i hit apple s it's uploaded a new version to dropbox which then allows me to go back through previous versions as well but also allows me to work essentially in shifts with other producers when they also use bitwig we make sure that you know we can maybe set the restrictions of right well I, i'm going to be using these three synths and so make sure you have a version of it as well so we'll make sure we're, we're running the same versions of each software package and then you know we can quite easily just go right i've just made a new version go check it out and there it is on their computer so i think you know the 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 technology is there for anyone and everyone to collaborate but i think maybe we're we're kind of sticklers for our our old ways of working and i, I think it's probably more a case of, of humans haven't quite caught up with the technology that's around them how has your work as a producer changed since we last spoke it's, it's been about four years i mean you, you mentioned a new software project you're working on what else has changed good question <laughs> i think the last time i spoke to you i would i had probably just signed my first track to mousetrap and i've been releasing with them since i've also started doing more work for sync companies as well for doing tv and film stuff beyond that I, I i'm not sure what's changed really i mean anything and everything and nothing i suppose I'm, did, did I'm you still... build a studio I, I feel like i saw some videos on facebook of you building a studio 
I did, and, and now I've lost it all as well. <laughs> I, I say lost, I moved on from there. So I had, so I was living in Cardiff, and I'm now living in Manchester. I've just moved here a month and a half, two months ago. So I'm in the process of designing a new studio to build in the garden of the house. But yeah, I had built a studio that was sort of focused on music production, sound design in an industrial estate in Cardiff, which... I was thoroughly happy in. Yeah, uh, I'm doing it all over again. Well, I've uh, I've made my my uh, over over investments. If no, if you don't have to go into that, but I've made my over investments of the past, and and I can understand. <laughs> so the work on like TV and film, and and releasing your stuff through Mousetrap. Can you talk a little a little bit more about that? What do you want to know? Well, well, so so like when you work with TV and film, what does that look like? Do you do you sit down in front of a an episode of House of Cards and then compose the music for it or something like no, that? No, 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 no. I uh, well, I, I mean, I, I suppose that's perhaps one of the ultimate aims. You know, I, I think it's always been a dream of mine and probably most musicians to to be able to provide a full, you know, to do the whole Hans Zimmer. But at the moment, the way it's been working for me is so I got approached by Universal Music to write some electronic dance music for a couple of TV shows. It, it, it was to be used as background music. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't big money project or anything like that. It was it was a, a fairly small project to be used on on the back end of a couple of TV shows which I did and thoroughly enjoyed because it was such a specific brief that I, I can't remember what the brief said, but at the time it was just so specific. They wanted, you know, certain types of sounds. They wanted a certain sort of melodic construct. And I ended up doing that. And I and I, I just really enjoyed working to a brief. It kind of made sense for me. So, so yeah, so I ended up becoming a registered composer and writer for Universal and have been doing a fair bit of that over the last few years. So what they tend to do is is rather than, for example, you know, Hans Zimmer's approach would be a director approaching him and asking to complete the entire score for a film. So this is an entirely different ball game. This is so Universal put together uh, essentially uh, catalogues of music that then get pitched towards certain shows or they might be approached by a show looking for something that isn't in their catalogue and then they'll quickly run around all their writers and composers trying to get, you know, fill in that gap in the catalogue, basically. So, yeah, so it's it's been a really interesting experience um, and, and that's actually then led me on to a few more recent projects where I've been approached asking, you know, oh, have you got something along the lines of X, Y and Z? We're looking for, you know, uh, something for a TV advert and you know again their briefs are so specific and they're looking for you know maximum 30 seconds of high impact music it's just it's an absolute pleasure to actually write that i i guess because it takes me out of my self questioning creative head you know as as a music writer and producer you know when you're producing for yourself as an artist you know you you're constantly second guessing everything and over analyzing your own work Whereas when somebody slaps down a brief and goes, we need this, you know, you can sort of just go, right, forget myself and I'll just go straight for that. And it, yeah, it can be a pleasure to do. I'm totally with you. I mean, I do, you know, some of the some of the work for this show is interviewing companies and, you know, I get paid to, to interview companies about their products sometimes. I tried to do an advertising company a couple of years ago where um, I worked with some companies to to make advertisements for them with with a group of creative people and that was that's kind of fun too like working on on marketing related stuff it does impose some of those creative constraints and it can be kind of interesting in that regard you know I heard a podcast recently about it was Alec Baldwin so Alec Baldwin has a podcast that's actually really good but he 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 interviewed this guy who collects these industrial orchestrals, I think is what they were called. But there was a time 30, 40, 50 years ago when companies like General Motors would make entire musicals about General Motors. It was this really weird industrial commercial excursion that a bunch of companies went on, and they would just pay these composers 
tons of money to make these like you know 30 to 40 minute musicals about general motors really strange time in music slash creative history but i think some of the composers completely loved the work for some i mean for whatever reason the constraints or you know whatever element the of money. it but <laughs> the money <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> doesn't hurt to be paid like you know if you you get paid and they impose some constraints you're like i can be creative within those yeah, constraints yeah. and i get paid for it i'm totally fine with that yeah <laughs> why not yeah i mean you know at the end of the day i think music can be both an art and a business and there's a huge overlap in there as well so you know it can be you know those those things aren't mutually exclusive nor inclusive so yeah i think because as an artist releasing stuff under my own name i'm very conscious that i am the brand and therefore i need to focus on particular areas of a genre or a uh, you know some sort of stylistically it needs to represent me and my brand I suppose but when you're working under a different name or no name and you know somebody slaps a brief that that says something you know in no uncertain terms this is what we're looking for it can be seen as a, a an enjoyable challenge then because you, you really don't need to think about it yourself and you just you you can just do it uh, and that can be i think because i spend most of my time you know second guessing my own work it can be quite liberating to sometimes not have to do that dom kane really great talking to you and i look forward to working with you in the future definitely thanks for having me GoCD is a continuous delivery tool created by ThoughtWorks. It's open source and free to use, and GoCD has all the features you need for continuous delivery. Model your deployment pipelines without installing any plugins. Use the value stream map to visualize your end-to-end -end workflow. And if you use Kubernetes, GoCD is a natural fit to add continuous delivery to your project. With GoCD running on Kubernetes, you define your build workflow and let GoCD provision and scale your infrastructure on the fly. GoCD agents use Kubernetes to scale as needed. Check out gocd.org slash sedaily and learn about how you can get started. GoCD was built with the learnings of the ThoughtWorks engineering team, who have talked about building the product in previous episodes of Software Engineering Daily, and it's great to see the continued progress on GoCD with the new Kubernetes integrations. You can check it out for yourself at gocd.org slash sedaily. And thank you so much to ThoughtWorks for being a longtime sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. We're proud to have ThoughtWorks and GoCD as sponsors of the show. Wow.